Hello and welcome everyone to our first lecture in this post-corona world. And uh, in this, we are all forced to study online. And uh, I will try, uh, before I start, what I'll do is I will try to set a few basics there. Uh, I will try to set a few basics and try to explain how I'm going to, how we're going to take up these classes. So uh, I will try to explain the methodology uh, by which we are going to follow, we are going to take up these classes. Uh, what I will be doing is uh, I will be uploading three files for each lecture. What, the first two files uh, you are already familiar with. One is going to be a PDF uh, handouts of the lecture, uh, a PowerPoint file with all the animations for you to understand things in a better way. And uh, in addition to this, there will be a third uh, file which will be a video explanation of the whole lecture. Uh, this is something that you would be hearing right now. Uh, what I'll try to do is I will try to upload all those videos on YouTube and provide you with, your, with a YouTube link for your convenience. And uh, <clears throat> what I recommend you to do, I think if uh, you understand how you can, how you should take up these lectures, uh, uh, if you have a certain learning methodology in your mind, it will be easier for you to understand and learn uh, to get the maximum out of these lectures. Uh, so what I would recommend you to do is first uh, to listen to the video lecture. And as, uh, as you're well aware of the usual practice that I follow in my classes, that I try to ask a lot of questions, I try to get the answers from all of you, uh, and once I have the answers from a number of students, uh, then based upon those answers, we discuss and we proceed. So I will try to follow the same methodology here. Uh, in my slides, you will see there will be limited uh, text as usual. Uh, what I will try is to put in a lot of questions in my slides. Uh, I will ask you those questions. Uh, what I suggest you is that you uh, what I suggest you is that you pause uh, when I when you hear a question, you should pause the video, think about the answer, and once you come up with your own answer, then proceed forward uh, in the video. Uh, this way, you can have a better understanding, and uh, this way, you can you can think better, and maybe have a have a better understanding of the whole stuff. Uh, I, I also suggest you to make your own notes alongside. Uh, this is something that's going to help you and assist you uh, while you proceed. Uh, once you are done with the video lecture, making all your notes, then what you can do is you can use the PDF uh, or uh, you can use the PDF handouts for your review. Uh, in the end, what I'll try is I will try to add um, a few reference slides. Uh, I will try to specify some exact references from the books. Uh, which you can refer to for, for further reading. So I think that can also be very helpful for you. And then finally, uh, based upon this video lecture, we will have uh, an online discussion session uh, using the Google Classroom platform that we have already uh, signed in. So this is how I plan to take up this whole coursework. Uh, first, you try to understand everything from the video. Uh, but while uh, you are listening to the video, you are making notes for yourself. And at the same time, uh, you are pausing the video at a number of places, thinking about the stuff by, by your own self and, uh, and then proceeding. Uh, you are making notes while uh, listening to the videos. Uh, then the PDFs would be there for you for your review. And in the end, there will be some uh, books which are available for further reading. And lastly, we can discuss and conclude things in the online discussion sessions uh, in the classroom we are going to have. Okay, so let's start. <coughs> and uh, we're going to start with a new topic here. And the topic is the permeability of soil. Uh, this is uh, this word should sound a little familiar to you since we have already had some discussion about it in our classes. Uh, so when you listen to the word permeability, what comes to your mind? What should come to your mind uh, based upon our previous discussions is 
that permeability is a science which deals with the flow of water through the soil. So uh, permeability is a measure of soil's ability to permit water to flow through the pores or the voids. Now the question is permeability, I can understand that this is permeability means that how the water flows through the soils, but the question is how does water flow through the soil? Why at all, why after all the water flows through the soil? Uh, so this question should uh, come to your mind. Now, in order to answer this question, we should, uh, you, you have to uh, move back a little bit and you have to think about the porous structure of the soil that we have. Uh, we know that the soil comprises of solid particles and having interconnected voids. So what happens is that uh, so what happens is that the water passes or flows through the voids, through the interconnected voids, and this is how uh, this is how the water flows through the soil. Uh, then uh, another important thing is uh, another important thing is that. The water always flows from a point of high energy to a point of low energy. Uh, this is not something that we are going to explain on the next on the coming slides further. Then we also know that different soils have different permeability. Uh, what it means is that uh, if we have a loose soil, for example, as you can see here on the left side of the screen, and if we have a dense soil, so we can very well understand from these figures that a loose soil has large pores. And because of the large pores, it will be easier for the water to flow through the soil compared to a dense soil. Uh, a dense soil shown on the right side of the screen is the one which has very closely bounded pores. The pores are smaller, and because the pores are smaller, it is difficult for the water to flow through the soil. So, because of this, uh, because of this, the dense soil is going to have a low permeability compared to compared to a high compared to a loose soil, which is going to have a high permeability. Now, in the same way, following the same thing, what do you think about the permeability of the coarse grain soils and the fine grain soils? Uh, now, what do you think, whether the coarse grain soils are going to have high permeability or the fine grain soils are going to have high permeability? Yes, you would have thought it right that the coarse grain soils, because of having the large void sizes, like, like these figures, so because of having large voids uh, in the coarse grain soils, like gravels or sands, they are going to have high permeability, but if you think about the fine grain soils like clays, so these clays or cells, they have, uh, because of the small particle sizes, the size of the pores would also be smaller. And if the size of the pores is going to be smaller, it's going to have very low permeability. Now the question comes that why is permeability important after all? Why do you think that permeability is important? Now, while I'm asking this question, you should think about that what are the different structures related to civil engineering in which permeability is important or the flow of water through the soil plays an important role. Now, just try to think of different pro nature of projects. Do you think that in case of road construction, permeability of soil would be important or in case of house construction, or in case of dams, or in case of dikes, or airports, what are the kind of projects or the structures where permeability would be important and how it would be important? Let me give you a few examples of these. Uh, permeability is important when we talk, particularly important when we talk about dam structures. For example, as you can see in the figure below, uh, so we have a dam structure in which the embankment of a dam, as shown here, this embankment is there to block the flow of water. Now when it is blocking the flow of water, this embankment, which is generally made by compacted soil, once it is blocking the flow of water, some of the water is going to flow through the dam body. Now this water, which is flowing through the dam body, obviously if 
we need to know that how much water is flowing through the dam body. Secondly, we need to know what is the speed of flow of water through the dam body. So these are the questions which we cannot answer until and unless we know about the science of permeability through the soil. In the same way, in this dam body, this water which is retained on the upstream side, some of this water is going to flow beneath the foundation soil as shown here. So again, the, if it is important for us to understand that how much water is flowing through, this, through the underground soil, what is the quantity of water, what is the speed of flow and other related things. And this is again, we cannot understand as uh, unless we have good understanding about the permeability of soil. In the same way, if you want to install a well somewhere, uh, you cannot in install a well somewhere unless you know how the water flows beneath the soil. Uh, why in some areas we say that you have to install a well of only maybe 10 or 15 feet deep and you're going to get fresh water. But in other areas, you may have to dig a well of maybe 100 feet to get fresh water. So all these things, you know, to answer all these questions, you have to have a good understanding of soil permeability and how the water flows through the soil. In addition to these, there are a lot of other fields like the slope stability, uh, soil filters, et cetera, et cetera, which you cannot get a good idea of uh, without having a good understanding of soil permeability. Now the question comes, why does the water flow through the soil after all? We have talked about this, that we have given an example of uh, a soil structure as shown in the figure here, in which the soil, in which water flows from point A to point B. But the question is, why does water flow from point A to point B? What, what do you think? Why is water flowing from point A to point B? The answer to this is that water flows from one point to another point because of the difference in the energy between the two points. Uh, now, point A would be at a higher, would be having higher energy compared to point B. This is why the water is flowing from point A to point B. In order to understand it in a more, more simpler way, you can think of this simple science experiment that you would have done maybe in your childhood, in which water, from one container which is placed at a higher elevation flows from the higher elevation container which has a higher energy to the lower energy container. So the same science acts over here as well. Okay, we have made this thing clear that the water, the water flows in the soil because of point A being at a higher energy compared to point B. But the important thing that you need to remember here is that while the water is flowing from point A to point B, some of the energy is lost during this travel. So you can well understand this thing, while the water is flowing from point A to point B, it has to follow a very curvilinear path. Now because of all these curves and humps, some of the energy is lost while moving from point A to point B. Now this energy which is lost because of the soil resistance is called, this loss of energy is called as the head loss. Now this concept of head loss is very important and this is very important because a number of our discussions in the following slides are going to be based upon the head loss studies. So it's important for you to understand why why the head why there is a head loss in uh, in the soil so whenever water is flowing from a point of higher energy to a point of low energy in order to overcome the resistance that it faces in uh, during its flow path there is some some of the energy is lost there and that is accounted for as head loss so let's move to the next thing and which is the Bernoulli's equation. Now this is something that you would have studied in your uh, fluid mechanics classes in the last semester. Uh, some of you might be able to recall what Bernoulli's equation uh, looks like. 
but for those of you who do not remember, let me just show it, show it here for you. So Bernoulli's equation states that the total head at any point in water under motion is the summation of the three heads, the pressure head, the kinematic or the velocity head, and the elevation head. In order to understand this, let's think of a simple scenario as shown in this figure. Now, in this figure, let's try to determine the total head at point P. Uh, now, when if we want to determine the total head at point P, according to the Bernoulli's equation, the total head at point P is going to be the summation or the addition of three heads, the pressure head, the velocity head, and the elevation head. Now, the elevation head would be the that would be the height from a certain reference, which is Z here. The pressure head would be given by this distance. And the kinematic head would be explained by the velocity or the movement of this particle. And this can be explained mathematically by this simple equation. Now, in this equation, we have three components, the pressure head, which is the pressure per unit unit weight of the mass, the velocity head, and the elevation head. And for in case you do not remember what head means, head is the energy per unit mass. So total head means that how much energy, if we have a unit mass, or let's say if we have one gram of water here, how much energy one gram of water is going to have. So this is what we mean by head. I think it is important for you to have a physical understanding of head. So although I'm using the term head, but probably what should come to your mind while listening to the term head is the energy. Because although uh, because energy is probably a little bit easier for you to comprehend physically. So although head and energy are slightly different, but uh, maybe for your understanding, whenever I use the term head, you should think of energy. So that will make things a little easier for you to understand. Now, uh, we have given that the total head is can be given by this equation. Now, in this equation, uh, in this equation, we have the pressure head, the velocity head, and the elevation head. But we also know that in case of soil, when we are talking about the flow of water through the soil, the velocity of flow is extremely, extremely small. Now, if the velocity of flow is extremely small, so isn't it possible that we can just ignore this velocity head or we can just say that this velocity head is so small that we can say that velocity head is approximately zero? Now, if the velocity head is zero or if we can ignore it, this equation can be simplified. And this equation can be simplified into this equation here. So in this equation, what we have is the velocity head disappears. And we can say that when we are talking about the flow of water through the soil, the total head is can simply be the addition of the pressure head and the elevation head. So we have seen a very simplified case here. Let's look at a slightly more complicated case in the next over here. What do we have here is <clears throat> we have uh, we have a pipe. Let's think of a pipe as shown here. This is a cross-sectional view of a pipe. This pipe is filled with soil, as you can see here in between this. There is soil. It is filled with soil. And the soil is obviously going to have some voids in between as well. So it is just you can think of a pipe, and that pipe is filled with soil. Now, let's assume that there is some water which is flowing through the soil. So some water is flowing through the soil. Maybe what we can do is we can connect a water pipe here and we can have another water pipe here. So this water pipe is pushing some water inside and the water is flowing out from the other end. You can just think of this, sort of, this kind of something. So let's try to apply the same Bernoulli's equation and the same concept that we have said in the previous slide on this uh, on this assembly. Now, 
what we want to do is we want to determine first that what is the total head at point a now this is point a what our first task is we want to determine the total head at point a so as per the discussion that we have we have had on the previous slide we know that the total head is the summation of the elevation head and the pressure head so if i want to determine the total head at point a what can i do i can simply determine what is the pressure elevation head which is given here as z a and what is the pressure head which is given over here so i can write the total head simply like this now or this u a which is generally a symbol to represent the water pressure u is the symbol which is used to represent the water pressure um, i can just in order for my own simplification i can replace it with this i can make it p a over gamma w plus z a so this first part it is the pressure head and this is the elevation head so this equation actually represents the total head at point a which is here at this point i would want to explain one little one other thing as well now <clears throat> when the water is flowing through a pipe you know from your concepts of fluid mechanics then water flow through a pipe it's going to be a pressure flow it's not going to be a gravity flow it is going to be a pressure flow now when it is going to be a pressure flow elevation head is a little easier for you to determine that it is simply the height from a certain reference from a certain reference point but how to determine the how to determine the pressure head now in order to determine the pressure head what we have simply done here is we have simply inserted a pipe here in this uh, we have simply inserted a small diameter pipe inside our test pipe now this small diameter pipe which we typically call as piezometer this has a property that whatever is the pressure at this point the water will rise equal to the pressure at this point if there is going to be more pressure this water will rise higher and if there is going to be less pressure this water level is going to be lower here so this height of water in this piezometer simply reflects the pressure head at this point now we have done this thing that we have determined the total head at point a in the same way we can determine the pressure head the total head at point b as well and total head at point b can very similarly be determined uh, can very similarly be determined by using the same equations there now if i know the point if i know the head at point a and if i know the head at point b I also know one more thing from my previous discussion. And I know this thing that whenever water passes from a point of higher energy to a point of low energy, or whenever the water flows through soil, it loses some of its energy. It loses some of its head. And because of this head loss, this is why the water level decreases from piezometer A to piezometer B water level decreases because of the loss of energy while the loss of energy while the water is moving from point a to point b now our what we want to do is it, it, had the energy loss been zero or if there was no energy loss from point a to point b this delta h here would have been zero and this water level would have been at the same level as the water level in piezometer a but this is not the case so in reality there is always going to be some head loss as shown in this figure now our next issue is how can we determine the head loss how can we determine that how much energy is lost while the water is moving from point a to point b so we want to determine how much energy is lost while moving from point a to point b now this is quite simple we know that point a is a point of high energy point b is a point of low energy so simply by taking the difference between the head at point a and head at point b we can determine the head loss so what we have done is we have simply inserted the values of ha here 
and HB here to determine the head loss there. Now this same head loss that we have determined here, this same head loss can be represented in another way. And how we can represent this? We can represent this in a non-dimensional form by using this equation shown here. And this equation says that the head loss is equal, is equal to I times L. Now L is quite easy for you to understand. L is simply the distance between the point, point A and point B, or L is the perpendicular distance between the point of higher energy and the point of lower energy. So L is quite simple to understand. And there is another way of explaining L, which is called length of the seepage path. Now this L is the distance of the seepage path from point A to point B. What is this I, however? This is something that we have not seen before. Uh, this I is known as the hydraulic gradient. And this hydraulic gradient is an important parameter which is used uh, in soil mechanics. And this is something that we are going to discuss more in the coming slides. But for the time being, you can just remember that I is mathematically expressed as delta H over L, head loss divided by the distance between uh, uh, head loss divided by the distance over which that head loss occur. So if you're clear about this simplified figure, this that the flow through a pipe, let's, and if you have got the basic concept of the hydraulic gradient, let's look at another example. Now this example is probably of something that you can obtain in a lab. Let's look at a bigger example of something that can be obtained in a field. Now, let's suppose you have this, you have this sort of a scenario in which you are in a certain ground and in this huge area, huge ground, you're asked to determine the hydraulic gradient. How to determine the hydraulic gradient? Now, determination of hydraulic gradient is very simple if you understand the basic definition. And basic definition is that Basic definition is that it is the delta H or the difference in head divided by the distance between them. So what you need to do is you need to have installed two wells or the two bore holes in the ground somewhere, anywhere in the ground, you have well number one. You just do a bore hole and from that bore hole, you can determine the water level. You can have a second bore hole and from the second bore hole, you can again determine the water level. So if you can determine the water level, you can simply call them H1 and H2, which is the height from a certain reference or the datum. So you just plug them in this equation and delta X, which is the horizontal distance between these two wells, this can help you determine the hydraulic gradient. Now let's take, make the difficulty level a little higher. Now we are, what we are doing is we are determining the hydraulic gradient and let's raise the bar a little bit more and let's try to determine the hydraulic gradient in a more complicated, in a more complicated scenario. Now what we have here is this is a more realistic scenario. There is a hilly area and in this hilly area uh, there is a water reservoir somewhere at the top. There is another water reservoir somewhere at the bottom. And we also know that this water reservoir at the bottom is probably made by, because of the flow of water from this top reservoir to the bottom reservoir through this pervious soil layer. And this is something that many of you might have observed during your visits to some of the hilly areas that you would have seen that there is a pond or there is a stream going somewhere. You don't see any water coming from the top of the mountain, then you, if you think closely, where is this water coming from? These kinds of waters generally come from underground flow of water, which is probably coming from some higher elevation source. So <clears throat> what we want to do here is that let's suppose that we call this as point A, which is our starting point. Let me call this as our point B, which is our uh, lowermost elevation point. 
and what we want to do is we want to what we want to do is we know that since point a is at a higher elevation compared to point b water is going to flow from point a towards point b along this path okay so we want to determine the hydraulic gradient and in order to determine the hydraulic gradient we know what we need to do is we first need to determine the head loss from point a to point b so first of all let's try to determine the head loss from point a to point b and if we want to determine the head loss from point a to point b what we need to do is we need to first determine the total head at point a and the total head at point b and then simply by taking the difference of those two total heads we can determine the head loss so how can we determine the total head at point a from our previous discussion we know that the total head at point a is going to be the summation of the elevation head what is going to be the elevation head elevation head is going to be the height of point a from a certain reference or a datum surface which can be represented like this and what is going to be the pressure head pressure head is simply the height of water divided by the unit weight of water so this now this represents the total head at point a or i can which i can represent as h a in the same way we can determine in we can determine the total head at point b this is going to be the elevation head at point b and in the same way we can determine the pressure head at point b and if we know the uh, elevation head and the pressure head we can determine the total head at point b in a similar way now once we know the total head at point a and total head at point b we can easily determine the head loss so what will be head loss here head loss is simply going to be h a minus h b which i can represent graphically like this this is what the head loss is going to be like now <clears throat> this is head loss what is my objective my objective is to determine the hydraulic gradient of this scheme that we can see in this figure now if i want to determine the hydraulic gradient i know hydraulic gradient is equal to head loss divided by length of the seepage path now what is the length of the seepage path here the length of my seepage path is or length of the flow path is actually the distance from point a to point b along which the water is flowing so actually this red line here represents my length of the seepage path now if i know the head loss and if i know the length of the seepage path i can easily determine the hydraulic gradient by using this simple equation and this is something which we have done on the in, on the previous slides as well okay so i hope uh, the concept of hydraulic gradient would be somehow clear to you guys now let's move to a slightly new concept and after once i'll we'll cover that new concept uh, we'll come back to the same slide that you are seeing right now now before going further let me just tell you what we are going to study in the next slide so far we have talked about the head loss and the hydraulic gradient but you also know that when the water is flowing from point a to point b we might also be interested in two more things one thing is that what is the speed of flow of water from point a to point b at what speed the water is flowing what is the velocity of flow of water so that is one thing that we are interested to find out and there is another thing that we are interested to find find out and that is that what is the total discharge or what is the total amount of water that is flowing from point a to point b or in other terms if i can put it that how many gallons per day or how many liters per day are flowing from point a to point b 
So the two things that we need to find out is number one, the velocity of flow of water from point A to point B, and second, the discharge or the flow of water, the quantity of water that is flowing from point A to point B. Now, these are the two things that we are going to determine on the next slides. And once we go through the basic concepts of velocity and discharge, we'll come back to the same slide as you are seeing right now, and we will determine the discharge and the velocity of flow on, on the same geometry. Now, talking about the velocity, we have to uh, we have to know about the Darcy's law. Now, this Darcy's law was presented by a scientist named Henry Darcy in 1856, and this is a very simple principle which states that the velocity of flow of water through the soil is directly proportional to its hydraulic gradient. The velocity of flow of water that is directly proportional to the hydraulic gradient. And this is something which can be mathematically expressed by using this equation. Velocity is proportional to the hydraulic gradient. And in this expression, I can remove the proportional, I can introduce a proportionality constant, and this equation becomes like this: V equals Ki, where K is the proportionality constant, which is known as the hydraulic conductivity or the coefficient of hydraulic conductivity of soil, or sometimes it is called the coefficient of permeability of soil. V, as we know, it is the velocity of flow of water through the soil, and I is the hydraulic gradient, something that we have already studied, and I, we also know that this is equal to delta H over L. Now, if we know the velocity of flow of water, our next task is to determine the total quantity of flow of water, or in other words, the total discharge through any cross section. So the quantity of flow of water can be determined by using the basic concept that you would have studied in fluid mechanics. And discharge is equal to Q times uh, V times A, Q equals velocity times the cross-sectional area. So this is the basic definition that you would have said it in fluid, fluid mechanics. Now, if, if you understand this equation, then it's very simple that this, you can replace the value of velocity here, and this equation translates into this, Q equals KIA. So it means that if you are interested to determine the discharge or the quantity of flow through any cross-section, what you need to know is, you need to know the cross-sectional area of the soil, you need to know the hydraulic gradient and the permeability of soil. If you know these things, you can easily determine the permeability. Now just remember this equation. Now just remember this equation and let's go back to the same example that we were discussing on the previous slide, which is here. Now, we have already determined the hydraulic gradient for this cross section. Now, if we want to determine the discharge or the quantity of flow flowing from point A to point B, how can we determine that? We know that the velocity of flow or the discharge can be determined by using the equation that we have derived on the previous slide. What is the equation that we have derived on the previous slide? This one, Q equals KIA. Now, we can just put the same equation here, Q equals KIA. So by using this equation, we can easily determine the total discharge through the soil. Now, what is the benefit of this thing? The benefit of this thing is, why are we even interested to determine the discharge from point A to point B? The Let me give you one practical scenario. The practical possible scenario is, that there is some village somewhere over here near point B at a downstream. Now this village would have some water requirements. They would need water for drinking, for feeding the cattle, for irrigation, etc., etc. Let's suppose that the amount of water this village requires is about 1,000 gallons per day. Now, <clears throat> if the amount of water that this village requires is 1,000 gallons per day, and the water flowing from point A to point B is less than 1,000 gallons per day, it means that this pond will dry out. 
it cannot work this village cannot survive so this village needs to have an alternate source of water to survive but let's suppose if this is the only source of water and you as an engineer have to decide whether you need to have another source of water for this village or not what will you do you will have to determine the total discharge or the total amount of water flowing from point a to point b and that is something you can do by using this equation as we as we have done here so this equation q equals kia is something which forms the basis of what we are going to do next uh, next now i hope from this slide it would be clear to you that our main objective in uh, in water flow studies or in the permeability studies one of the main objective is to determine that discharge or the amount of flow of water from one point to another so this is our main objective so and that main objective can be determined by using this equation so on the next slide i'm going to show you the same equation and i'm going to lead my discussion from there so this is the same equation we were talking about now it means that if i want to determine the quantity of flow if i want to determine the discharge what i need to know is one is i need to know the cross sectional area now area is something which is a geometric property uh, in the previous example where i had with in this example uh, how can i determine the area area determination is fairly easy i can just have the determine the average cross sectional area of this path so I can have the average cross-sectional area of this path, and that would be my A. So this is a geometric property. It has nothing to do with the soil or the amount of water that is present. So this is something that I can easily determine most of the times. So uh, <clears throat> cross-sectional area is easy to determine, but the other two things are a little difficult to determine and depend a lot about uh, on the soil properties. So in order to determine the quantity of flow or discharge, which is our main objective, there are two things that we need to determine. One is the hydraulic conductivity, K, and the second is the hydraulic gradient. Now this hydraulic conductivity, this explains that how permeable the soil is. In hydraulic conductivity, it is also known as the coefficient of hydraulic conductivity. It is also known as the coefficient of permeability of soil. Now this explains and this tells us how permeable the soil is. In simple words, for a coarse grain soil, for sand and gravel, this K would be very large. And for fine grain soils like clay and silt, this K would be very small. So a smaller value indicates, a smaller value of K indicates low permeable soil and a high value of k indicates a high permeable soil and this hydraulic gradient actually define uh, defines that how large is the driving head how much push the water is getting from the external sources to flow through the soil so larger the hydraulic gradient it more will be the discharge easier would be the flow or easier would be for water to flow through the soil and smaller the hydraulic gradient difficult it would be for the water to flow through the soil so our next discussion is mainly based so from here you can easily understand this thing that our main objective is to determine discharge and in order to determine discharge we need to determine two main things one is the coefficient of permeability or k and second is the hydraulic conductivity, hydraulic gradient. So our next discussion and the next couple of lectures, in fact, are going to be based upon just these two things, how to determine K and how to determine I. I repeat this thing. Our next couple of lectures actually are going to be dependent on this thing that how to determine K and how to determine I. So let's quickly have a look at what are the different methods by which we can determine K. So K or the hydraulic conductivity can be determined either in the laboratory or by in the field by performing some experiments 
or lastly there are some empirical equations or general ways uh, some mathematical expressions which can be used for the determination of uh, hydro coefficient of hydraulic conductivity and for the hydraulic gradient for the determination of hydraulic gradient we generally follow some geometrical procedures or there is a science of flow nets which is often used for the determination of hydraulic conductivity for the determination of hydraulic gradient so our next couple of lectures are actually going to be depend on the discussions of for the determination of hydraulic conductivity and the determination of hydraulic gradient so before we go further uh, i'm just going to cover the last uh, one concept last concept for today's lecture and that is the difference between the seepage velocity and the superficial velocity we know from Darcy's law that V equals Ki and V equals from V equals Ki we also know this thing that uh, so from Darcy's law we know that V equals Ki now the question is that how to practically determine the velocity how to practically determine this thing okay so the question is how to practically determine the velocity or how to practically determine that at what speed the water is flowing through the soil now in order to determine this we have to make use of the same equation that we've been using earlier and we can rearrange this equation to this form which the velocity equals q by a now using this equation on this figure we can tell that if we want to determine the velocity we need to know what is the discharge and what is the cross-section area so knowing the discharge is not very difficult if we have some meter installed here that flow meter can easily tell us that what is the amount of water that is going inside the soil that is something that we can easily determine but what which area should i determine should i take uh, now, I, should I take the total cross-sectional area of this pipe? Now, if I look at some at the particulate level, I can see that I can draw this soil in this form. The soil consists of some soil solids and some voids. So, if I take the total cross-sectional area of this pipe, it will be similar to taking the total cross-sectional area like this. Now, if I take this total cross-sectional area and put it in this equation, I will get some velocity. And the question is, would that be the real velocity of the water through the soil? Now, this is the velocity which we call, which we generally call as the superficial velocity, or in other words, we call it as the average velocity. Now, what does this average velocity mean? This average velocity means that the average velocity of flow of water through the soil. What we are doing here is that this average velocity V actually represents the total discharge divided by the total cross-sectional area of the pipe or the total cross-sectional area which is represented here. I think it might not be very clear to you, but the next thing what I'm going to say is probably going to make the previous words a little bit more clear. What is actually happening when the water is flowing through this pipe, the water is not flowing through the entire cross section. Rather, the water is only flowing through the vo interconnected voids. The water is not flowing through the entire cross section of the pipe. If the water is only flowing through these voids so if the water is only flowing through these voids in this equation should we use this total cross-sectional area or should we use only the area of the voids it's some logical conclusion is that we should be using the area of the voids because that is something which is going to give us the actual velocity of flow of water through the soil and this is what we get if we use the cross-sectional area of the voids we get 
the seepage velocity or the actual velocity of the water through the soil. Now this is this actual velocity or seepage velocity is something which gives us the velocity of flow through the voids only. Now, if you can understand the concept of seepage velocity and the superficial velocity, now you can probably think and tell me, what do you think that what would be more? Would the average velocity we be greater than the actual velocity or would the vice versa be the case? Yes, you probably would have guessed it right, that the actual velocity would be much higher compared to the average velocity. The reason being, the actual velocity considers that the water is only flowing through the voids, which has a much smaller cross-sectional area compared to average velocity, which considers that the water is flowing through the entire pipe cross-section. So which would definitely be smaller. And the problem that we generally get is, our actual interest is to determine the actual velocity of the soil. But it is always easy for us to determine the average velocity of soil because it's easy for us to determine the total cross-sectional area. But if someone asks you that, what is the cross-sectional area of the voids? It's a little difficult for you to determine. So what we generally do is we have developed a mathematical expression by which if you know the average velocity, you can easily convert it into the actual velocity. And that mathematical expression goes like this, that the average velocity equals porosity times the actual velocity, or the superficial velocity equals porosity times the seepage velocity. Now, you should remember this expression because this comes in very handy uh, in actual calculations. So what it means is that we have seen that we can easily determine V or the superficial velocity. If we know the discharge, we can easily determine the total cross-sectional area and determine V. And we also know from our previous knowledge that we have studied earlier that it's not very difficult for us to determine the porosity. We can determine the porosity as well. So if we have the velocity, the average velocity and porosity, we can easily convert it into superficial velocity. There is a certain derivation for this expression as well, which I have, which is presented on this next slide. However, I'm not going to explain this derivation as it's pretty simple and similar to what we have done earlier. So I would leave it for you to understand by yourself. And then the last thing is that I've just summarized some data here for you that how we can classify different soils with respect to permeability. As we said earlier, that K is the coefficient which, is generally, which generally represents the permeability of the soil. K is known as the coefficient of permeability of soil. Uh, it, is generally expressed in, uh, it is generally expressed in terms of uh, in velocity units, that is distance per unit time. And we have, we can define different types of soils like uh, coarse grain soils would have a higher permeability compared to the fine grain soils, which will have much lower permeability. And finally, these are some references which you can use to further your knowledge.